Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Please switch your phones to airplane mode. I'm Shabelle Farhat, the chair of the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics here at Stanford. On behalf of our provost, Persis Drell, I welcome you to our panel discussion on breaking barriers, the future of space exploration. Now, this uh, event is part of our symposium on women in aerospace engineering. We have organized this one and a half day event in collaboration with MIT and the University of Colorado at Boulder. Our objective is to inspire outstanding women researchers in aerospace engineering and give them a unique opportunity to present their work, discuss emerging trends, learn about careers, and most importantly, build their network. We are in the Silicon Valley, the global center for high technology, venture capital, innovation, and social media. In our community, we are most enthused, however, about modern flight systems and space systems. These continue to be two of the most important technology pillars for a worldwide aerospace enterprise that fuels economic growth, bring together people and cultures, and supports the exploration of distant worlds. We are living the most exciting times for space exploration. Industry is launching rockets into space and bring them back for reuse. Startups are or will soon be deploying constellations of hundreds of small satellites for global broadband communication and other applications that benefit society. So within these two contexts of women in aerospace engineering and space exploration, we have invited two distinguished panelists and an accomplished panel moderator to share with us their thoughts on breaking the barriers and the future of space exploration. All three are esteemed alumni of Stanford, and two of them are actually alumni of the department. So let me say a few first, say first a few words about our panelists. So Dr. Kathleen Rubens, known also as Kate Rubens, was selected by NASA to be an astronaut in 2009. She completed her first space flight on Expedition 4849, where she became the first person to sequence DNA in space. She has logged 115 days in space and conducted two spacewalks. Kate holds a PhD in cancer biology from Stanford. Ms. Kendra Short, she has spent 27 years so far at JPL, where she currently serves as the Deputy Program Manager for NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program. She helps leading the hunt for new worlds throughout our galaxy, where real estate probably will be cheaper than in Palo Alto. <laughs> Kendra holds an MS in Aerospace Engineering, also from Stanford. Now, our panel moderator is Tess Hatch. She is an investor at Bessemer Venture Partners. Think of Help, LinkedIn, Yelp, LinkedIn, Blue Apron, what else, Box, and uh, DocuSign. And she focuses on commercial space, cybersecurity, and drones. She has graduated from our department last year. She was an all-star, student and yet found the time to write a space comic, Ada Wright, that I discovered on the web. So I'm expecting that we're going to have a cool panel this afternoon, so expect a special atmosphere. Before I yield the floor to Tess, I would like to thank our sponsors who made this event possible. The King Abdullah City of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, Breakthrough Initiatives, Planet, and the Stanford School of Engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, Tess Hatch. Thank you, Professor Farhat. Thank you, Professor Farhat. This evening, we'll begin with presentations from both of our speakers on their professional background, career trajectories, as well as some special highlights from their current work. Then, 
you all will have the opportunity to ask questions to our speakers. Please submit and upvote questions to www.slido using the event code WIA18 that you can see on the bottom of the slide. I know I am very much looking forward to learning from these extraordinary women. Now, please join me in welcoming Ms. Kendra Short. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you heard, my name is Kendra Short, and uh, I am uh, currently the Deputy Manager for Exoplanets Exploration Program at JPL. Uh, I am very pleased to be here. Uh, Stanford is my home. I grew up in Palo Alto. I graduated from Pali High across the street, and uh, I was very happy to uh, be able to come back here for graduate school. And uh, so I am very pleased to uh, share my career experiences and a little background about myself. And uh, it's kind of hard to do that in about 10 minutes. So I will uh, try and give you a glimpse and you're free to take it wherever you want to in the Q&A session, okay? So some of us are lucky to have a moment in our lives when we find the passion that will drive us for the rest of our years. Um, I was so lucky in about third or fourth grade when my dad took me to a sidewalk astronomers club in San Francisco and I looked through a telescope and I saw Saturn and I thought it was the most amazing thing in the world. It was small, it was fuzzy, it was hard to see, but it was real and it made me think that I wanted to be out there in space. I wanted to be part of space and explore space. So I kept asking my, my, myself questions, you know, what, what is beyond our solar system? What's beyond our galaxy? Uh, what came before the universe was created? And so I was hooked in third or fourth grade. Growing up in my era, it was uh, Carl Sagan and Cosmos and the space shuttle and Sally Ride was my hero. Uh, so I even uh, wanted to be an astronaut myself. Applied, didn't make it, stopped applying. <laughs> So I'm excited to uh, share the stage with, uh, with a real astronaut. Um, but uh, I worked at NASA Ames in high school. I got, was lucky enough to get a summer job in one of their intern programs, and it was, uh, was a life-changing experience. I got to do uh, zero-gravity simulations on rhesus monkeys while I was a junior in high school, and that was really exciting. Uh, and from there, I went to Princeton for undergrad. Uh, I did uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering. Uh, met my best friends for life there. And uh, uh, came right out of school and started to work for JPL. So I've been there actually 29 years this July. Um, and uh, it's been the best experience of my life. Uh, JPL, I was able to take a leave of absence, come back home here to Stanford and uh, get my master's degree, which was fantastic. And then the rest of my uh, life has been an overflowing basket of, uh, of uh, family and career and all of the activities we like to do, camping, hiking, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, you name it. Um, I, uh, I am very pleased to be, uh, be working at JPL. Um, I've been there 29 years, and in those years, I've had quite a lot of uh, assignments and job titles and uh, projects. Um, Everything from uh, new work, new concepts, uh, all the way through line management and flight projects, mostly flight projects. Um, so I'm going to share a couple of highlights with you. Uh, oops, sorry, let me go back up, back up. Um, the first flight project that I did uh, was uh, the Cassini mission to Saturn. I, I was a young uh, mechanical engineer, and I got to work on some secondary structure around the VIMS instrument. And uh, it, was a, it was a terrific experience. Um, that's my future husband uh, standing next to me in that picture from way, way back. And um, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was with mixed uh, emotions that I watched the Cassini Grand Finale uh, just a few months ago. Um, there were a lot of us at JPL that were uh, sad to see that spacecraft go. Uh, a very exciting uh, project that I, I worked on was Mars Pathfinder. This one I worked on uh, Cradle to Grave. Uh, I started when it was a cartoon concept, uh, just uh, pencil sketches on a piece of paper. 
Um, and it was actually supposed to be a pa an entry, descent, and landing pathfinder for a real mission called the Measure Network. It was an environmental network mission. Well, the network mission got canceled, as many missions at NASA do. Uh, most of them don't make it to a, to a real flight mission. Uh, but they decided to add a rover uh, to the project and uh, call it Sojourner eventually, and uh, it became a standalone mission in and of itself. Um, so I worked on that. I did a lot of system testing. I did airbag retraction testing. I did uh, lander release testing from the back shell up at China Lake Weapons uh, Station. And I uh, uh, ended up uh, doing separations engineering, which uh, meant I was responsible to make sure all of the major separation events happened properly. So that involved hardware design, dynamic analysis, uh, uh, clearance uh, studies, and things like that. I joined the assembly test and launch team and got to assemble the flight spacecraft uh, with a team of people and traveled out to Florida with it to get it ready for launch. So very exciting mission for me early in my career. Um, and then uh, perhaps a dream come true was to be able to work on the shuttle radar topography mission. I, I got to work with the, uh, the shuttle team at JSC, which are outstanding, um, and I got to uh, interact with the astronauts. Uh, this was a mission to uh, develop a high-resolution topographic map of the Earth over a 14-day mission. It was reflying the Circe antenna in the cargo bay with a deployed uh, reflect array on a 100-foot boom. Uh, my job was designing the primary structure that held the canister to the Circe antenna, and the challenge with that was uh, in order to meet the um, safety requirements of the shuttle, we had to be able to leave the boom in space if it didn't stow properly, because if it didn't stow properly, you can't close the doors and come back home. So my structure was an explosive structure. It had separable uh, joints uh, to pull the structure apart and the harness and everything like that, and do that all without moving an inch relative to the shuttle so that the shuttle could gently back away from it, leaving, uh, leaving the uh, payload in space. So I, uh, I was one of three mechanical engineers on console at JSC uh, working the operations during that mission, and I think I aged about 10 years in the last 30 missions, <laughs> 30 minutes of the mission, when the antenna actually did get stuck. <laughs> and I thought I would have to jettison the payload. So. As I'm going through my anomaly procedure, getting ready to uh, invoke my explosive structure, uh, my colleagues were uh, working their anomaly procedures and were able to actually jam that antenna on and, and get confirmation that it was latched. And we did not have to leave uh, the hardware in space. So, phew. Um, after that, I decided to uh, go into what we call line management, organizational management, people management, because nobody's life was ever in jeopardy because their time card didn't get turned in on time. So it was a little less stressful. Um, so I've, uh, I was a group supervisor, a deputy section manager, and perhaps my favorite uh, line management position at JPL was uh, the manager of the mechanical systems division. Uh, we had, I was... My first day on the job, I was on maternity leave. I got the job while I was pregnant with my first child, so that was an interesting experience, but it all worked out just fine. Um, we uh, ranged between 400 to 700 people uh, through the nine years that I was the division manager. And we had a huge breadth of uh, disciplines from structural engineering, material science, thermal, propulsion, uh, planetary protection, um, all kinds of things. So, uh, and we had everybody from early career hires to 50 year uh, on the job, uh, PhD scientists and researchers. So it was a very challenging job and, and very rewarding at the same, same time. One of the hallmarks of my time as a division manager was we started and finished the Mars Science Laboratory project. Uh, while I was a division manager. And this was a huge project at JPL. We did uh, a lot of work on it. Uh, probably in the mechanical division, we spent over a thousand work years of engineering time uh, just on the mechanical elements alone. And we probably delivered about $400 million worth of deliverable products to the project. So it was a very challenging uh, project, but very satisfying to see the first time we uh, executed a drilling operation that was the last system that needed to work from mechanical and they all worked just fine. So very rewarding. Um, while I was a division manager, I decided to do something kind of fun and crazy. I proposed a uh, new technology concept to NASA's Blue Sky Technology Project or program called NIAC, uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts. 
And I proposed to be able to build an entire uh, functional spacecraft out of inkjet printed electronic circuits and flexible substrates, uh, now better known as flexible hybrid electronics. Um, and that was a, a very uh, fun and exciting project. I did that uh, for a phase one and phase two, and I was the, the PI for that. Uh, we actually built a functional spacecraft, uh, sensors all the way through power generation, uh, data uh, communication systems, and things like that. Um, so it was, it was very fun. And um, I was uh, uh, privileged to be part of the uh, Out of This World uh, 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 book series that NASA produced on some of the NIAC concepts, uh, some STEM education targeted towards about maybe fourth grade or so. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I left the division and uh, worked on an earth science project for a little while, surface water ocean topography in payload management, and that was, uh, that was great. But I spent about three years on SWAT and then saw an opportunity to move into the uh, uh, exoplanets exploration program. I've been there about uh, a little more than two years now. And we are NASA's uh, program for um, uh, exploring uh, and looking for life outside of our solar system. So our primary goals are to discover planets around other stars, characterize their properties, uh, orbits, masses, uh, spectral characteristics of the atmosphere, and identify candidates that could harbor life. So we actually have confirmed uh, 30, a little over 3,500 stars, uh, or uh, planets around other stars. Uh, we have thousands more candidates that are awaiting uh, confirmation and uh, um, uh, follow-up observations. Most of those planets have been found uh, using the transit method, which is the, the slight dip in, in uh, uh, light intensity uh, as the planet uh, shadows the star. Um, and so most of those uh, were found by the Kepler mission, uh, which is uh, managed uh, uh, right down here uh, at Ames. Uh, NASA Ames. So Kepler had three uh, outstanding or astounding uh, results. Uh, the first is that, on average, statistically speaking, there is uh, one planet for each of the stars in the night sky. There are a lot of planets out there. We didn't know that more than a couple of decades ago. So it was uh, um, uh, really an amazing discovery that they found so many. Uh, also, what's interesting is that small planets are the most common type in the galaxy that we've seen, that we've detected so far. Uh, things that are less than uh, Neptune size. Uh, there's a lot of planets that we have found that we don't have an analog in our solar system, and that's very interesting as well. Um, and then one other thing that they were able to conclude is that Earth-sized planets uh, in the habitable zone, that's the uh, distance from the star where liquid water could exist, are actually pretty common. Uh, frequency, it, large error bars on this, but you know, 20 to 30 percent, likely. So, uh, an amazing mission. Um, in addition to the Kepler mission, our program does a lot of other things. We do a significant amount of public engagement and communications. Um, we do a lot of ground-based uh, instrumentation. We've got a precision radial velocity instrument uh, coming on board, uh, coming online in a couple of years. Uh, we also manage the NASA time on the Keck telescope. Uh, we manage the NASA Science uh, Institute down at uh, Caltech campus, the uh, data center for all of the uh, exoplanet data. And then a significant, amount, a significant portion of the program is technology development, looking forward into what do we need for the next generation of exoplanet missions. Um, and a significant uh, 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 development that we're working on is uh, something to help us with direct imaging of, of exoplanets. Direct imaging is the best way to get a spectral uh, signature of the atmosphere, and so we want to be able to do better at that, and uh, perhaps uh, fly one uh, rendezvousing with the W first mission if uh, the science is endorsed by the Decadal Committee, or uh, even there's large uh, studies for the future that we're we're looking at. So uh, direct imaging is uh, done with an occulter. It can either be inside the uh, telescope or inside the camera. Uh, which is called a coronagraph, or it could be an external occulter flying thousands of kilometers in formation with a telescope, and that is called a starshade. So we have a large technology project going on right now to develop a starshade. It's a deployable mechanical structure that's opaque to uh, starlight, and um, here, let me run that, run that again. Um, and uh, uh, oh, let me go back. Um, 
And it, the, the baseline uh, design concept that we have is uh, 26 meters in diameter. It's pretty, uh, um, pretty large. And so we're working on a technology development project right now that will take us to technology readiness level five by about 2022. Uh, and so that's being done uh, at JPL. We're studying uh, the key, uh, key technology gaps that go along with uh, the starshade. Uh, one, how well it can operate as an optical element and uh, um, uh, suppress the starlight and allow us to uh, image the reflected light of the planet. Uh, we're also working on deployment accuracies and structural stability, on-orbit thermal stability, and we're also looking at um, uh, the lateral sensing form formation flying. These things are flying thousands of kilometers, 20, 100,000 kilometers uh, away from each other, and they have to formation fly to within uh, a, a meter or so lateral. So it's pretty challenging. Anyway, um, so we have, uh, have a, a lab at JPL that we're, uh, we're working on these, these concepts, and um, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be successful in getting a full-size uh, demonstration. So uh, to, to wrap up, uh, until we have the means and the aspiration to go explore some of these uh, planets that we have found around other stars, uh, the Exoplanet uh, Program Office has created the Exoplanet Travel Bureau, which allows you with a little bit of artistic creativity to imagine what these planets might look like based on scientific foundations. Um, so we had created a series of exoplanet travel posters. These can be downloaded in high resolution off of the uh, exoplanets website if you want to, uh, to have a collection for your, for your office. Um, so anyway, I thank you for the opportunity to come here and share a little bit about what I do at JPL. And, uh, and I hope that you all uh, work with me and, uh, and continue to stay in aerospace. Uh, to explore the, the galaxy of worlds that we have and, and yet inspire our own while, while doing it. So thank you very much. So thinking about a talk title, this isn't particularly coherent. It just happens to be my three favorite things that I'm going to talk to you about today, microbes, spacesuits, and genomics. Um, so about two years ago now, it was uh, we depressed to vacuum. This is a long process. It takes hours and hours. We open the hatch, uh, and, and you have your feet dangling out of the hatchway, and the planet's 250 miles below you. And there's really nothing that you can do in any of your training or, or mentally, particularly to prepare for this. And I wasn't sure exactly how this was going to feel. Um, but it was really exciting. We got the hatch open. I saw the planet. I guess my legs were kicking because they called in the download video and said, you know, you, you were pretty excited to actually <laughs> get out of the hatch here uh, and go do a spacewalk. And uh, this, is, this is really one of the most incredible laboratories that humans have built uh, in space. And so it was absolutely amazing to be climbing around on the outside of it, um, let alone this, this beautiful blue marble that distracts you from the actual task at hand. But one of our questions was, uh, you know, how, how do we get here? How do, how do we do this in our careers? And, and this was not necessarily my career trajectory. So I, I was a research scientist. I worked in a lab. I had a lab at MIT. Um, I was growing my research group. I had about 14 uh, students and postdocs and staff. And uh, really was going to do uh, research and, and field work for the rest of my life. We had a, a study site in Congo, um, which was an interesting transportation challenge in and of itself, a little bit different from the space station, um, but was really fortunate to work with uh, just incredible uh, doctors out there and, and wonderful folks in my lab. Um, and one of the things that we spent a lot of time was thinking about how to build containment labs and do uh, genomics of infectious disease in remote areas. And so um, I'd spent quite a bit of time in this thing, which we actually call a spacesuit when you're working in the biosafety level four. And so this was very challenging when I, when I came to NASA to do my interview, um, because these were people that wore actual spacesuits, and I wasn't sure what to call this particular piece of equipment. <laughs> so I settled on containment suit. Um, the, the way I got here is, is I, was, I was incredibly happy doing research and doing lab work, and I, this is really what I thought I was going to do for my entire life. And one of my friends uh, was working in, in the government and had looked at usajobs.com and said, uh, well, Kate, you know, there's astronaut applications online. Isn't that hilarious? And she was joking, 
um, I was writing a grant and decided to procrastinate that day on specific aim two, so I sent in my astronaut application. Um, it was, this was not completely out of the blue. Uh, as a kid, this was, this was the picture of my wall growing up, and uh, we saw the great uh, shuttle posters you had. I'm going to date myself to a very specific era by the 90210 poster <laughs> next to all of the galaxy photos. Um, but this, you know, this was, this was definitely my dream when I was a child, and I let that go somewhere around 15 or 16 because astronaut is not an actual job that anybody really does for a career. And I'd gotten really interested in viruses and, and molecular biology at that point. Um, so I applied to NASA, uh, got accepted, went through the basic astronaut training, and uh, eventually got assigned a mission. This is my crew of Expedition uh, 48, and we were there for 48 and 49. Now, NASA training is, is incredibly interesting. This is not uh, your normal job training. You do um, a, a wide variety of things. Uh, you know, you come in, you learn how to fix airplanes. This is an excellent uh, job if you can, if you're a good mechanic, you're going to spend a lot of time fixing the space station. So it's good to learn how to fix uh, spacecraft. You learn how to fly these airplanes. This is also uh, pretty fantastic. I did not mind this part so much. It's got a roll rate of 720 degrees uh, per minute. So this is, this is quite a bit of fun. Um, we learned a lot about uh, the spacecraft that we're working on. So, um, you know, how to, how to fix fluid lines, how to deal with things in a pressurized environment. Um, we spend a lot of time actually working on things like free flyer robotic capture. So uh, you're traveling along at Mach 25, your other spacecraft is at Mach 25, you um, are, are going to grapple this with a robotic arm, and you can't have a, a hard connection. You can put torque forces into the vehicle. So you have to go into a free flyer mode uh, and essentially be in, in complete free drift while you're maneuvering in six degrees. Um, and uh, it takes a, a fair amount of practice on how one might actually do this. Um, we learn how to, uh, this is the Russian side of the space station, we learn how to replace components here, uh, fix this diagnose. We spend quite a lot of time in the sim, uh, the spacecraft simulating launch and entry. Um, it's always on fire. It's, this is, this is your absolute guarantee. Any sim is going to end with a fire or rapid depress. Um, you get a little bit used to that. We do things like water survival. Um, we do uh, winter survival. Uh, worst of all, we do Russian press conferences. This is the hardest survival. <laughs> um, answering questions from the press in Russian. Um, I'd take the, the Moscow forest any day. And really, at the end of all of this training, um, you end up, uh, this is on the opposite side of the business end of this uh, rocket here. And so this is a pretty incredible experience. Um, space Station, uh, like I said, this is one of the most amazing laboratories that we have. It's a really interesting place. Um, it's, it's, it's equipment everywhere. There's not a lot of thought to how one might um, design this to be visually appealing or, for example, tack down your cables. Um, but it's a wonderful place to live. There's incredible things that happen in space in terms of combustion, uh, things that we can look at without uh, the influence of, of convection, uh, buoyancy. Uh, we've got incredible instruments on the outside of space station. This is alpha magnetic spectrometer. It's looking for uh, dark matter in the universe. We're actually planning a mission right now to look at some servicing of this instrument. Uh, material science is incredible. The, the influence of atomic oxygen, what happens in vacuum, uh, these thermal cycles of material. And this is really a place where you can test spacecraft materials in the actual environment that they're going to, to be in. Um, water behaves completely differently. So surface tension takes over. And it's interesting, all the experiments that we design on Earth, we really have this 1G bias in our head about how we think everything's going to work. It is amazing uh, when you get up on board and you actually see what happens to water, the interesting things it does, what happens to bubbles in water. Um, for a biologist, this does great things for cellular structures. You can grow these really delicate structures in three dimensions. Um, cells will settle to the bottom of the plate. Uh, on Earth, but in space, um, you don't have that effect, and so you can actually look at delicate cellular structures without the fluid shear forces of a rotating vessel. Um, so we can do uh, a lot of culture-based experiments. Uh, we can do, uh, this is the first DNA sequencing, and I was so nervous about setting this experiment up because this is the first time that we were doing it, that I set the whole thing up, and then I went and got a, a you know, a workstation light so that I would have good illumination, and then I went and got a headlamp just so I really could see what I was doing experimentally. And then I finally went and got some magnifying glasses so that I could, and, 
At this point, the gr I've come off and on camera three different times, and the ground was really wondering what we were going to do at the end of the day when I, Kate was done putting on all of her headgear. Um, but we did uh, sequencing. Uh, we published this. This is the first nanopore DNA sequencing on the space station. One of the things we were very interested in sequencing for is microbial analysis, so mapping the entire microbiome of the interior of the spacecraft. This is a really interesting, unique habitat that's an environmental niche that's evolved separately from Earth. We randomly resupply it with microbe producers and uh, trying to think about what's going on in, inside our volume of habitable space is very interesting. Uh, another thing that, that you do is, is spacewalks and uh, in spacesuits, and, and we do have a jetpack. It's a bad day if you're using your propulsion system because it means you become detached from structure. So we have them, we try to not use them. Um, it's a very interesting process getting ready for a spacewalk. I know that, that some of you are working on things like um, what's going on with different uh, exploration atmospheres and pressures. You have to get in the suits. This is a six hour process to get ready. We breathe pure oxygen to help com combat decompression sickness. We go down from uh, 14 uh, to 10.2 PSI. Uh, and part of this, we end up getting our suits down to 4.3 PSI for our actual uh, spacewalk operation. And this does really interesting things to the human body. Um, your voice gets very echoey and, and boomy. Um, it's dark outside in space. It's very, very dark. Uh, you can feel incredibly alone. Uh, when I was out on the, the P6 solar array, I remember thinking it's, you know, fourth night pass of the spacewalk. I'm here all by myself. My crewmate is, you know, on the other side of the space station. I feel very, very alone right now in the universe. And then I thought, well, he's a little bit lower than I am. He's a bit more nadir. So this makes me the zenith most person in the universe. And that was a happy thought that got me through to the next day pass. So the conditions change incredibly rapidly. This is the nadir side of space station, the SpaceX vehicle on the arm. And you can see about 10 seconds later, the sun's rising uh, and it's very bright. Um, the way we, we manage spacewalks and tools and, and suits is an incredible engineering challenge. I'm happy to talk in gory detail uh, about any of this later on. Suffice it to say, it's, it's interesting to do a task when you have mass to manage, but you don't have a gravitational vector. If you get very involved in your bag, um, you end up completely upside down. So this, this, this doesn't happen to you in the lab. Maybe you get so interested in your experiment you forget to go home, but you don't end up upside down. Uh, we do have challenges in terms of things like micrometeoroid debris. Um, we've got location and positional challenges. So this is out between the P4 and the P6 solar array. Um, and you can see these two little humans here. And then zooming out a little bit, uh, you can start to see uh, how, how little the humans are compared to this massive structure. And so it's actually a fantastic place to work. And we're thinking about next generation of spacesuits and how we're going to build planetary suits. And so uh, with that, I will open this up to questions, and we'll get our panelists up here uh, and answer any other questions that you may have. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for those lovely presentations. And uh, we're looking forward to some Q&A. So all of you get your questions ready and start submitting. And, and while that's going, I'd love to start with how can we make space more accessible to all of humanity? And if we should. Well, I'll, I'll speak from the robotic side. I'll let you talk about the uh, actually traveling into space. Um, I, we, public engagement and communication is a significant part of what NASA does uh, because we are funded with the general public's money. We are funded with government money. And uh, we need to return on that investment to the general public. And so we actually spend a lot of effort to make the uh, excitement of space accessible to the general public, make the results of space exploration accessible to the general public. Um, and for a lot of us, uh, it, that, that's as far as we're going to go. We may not make it into the astronaut program uh, and be able to travel to the moon or Mars. And so by sharing the excitement, the discovery, the knowledge that we gain from space exploration, I think we're, we're helping to, to reach a large public audience and make it accessible to them. Um, and I think we should continue to do that and continue to uh, uh, focus on that. 
Absolutely. I think everybody should go to space. I think we should open <laughs> this up. This shouldn't be uh, just this small group of people. And, and uh, I hope you enjoyed a little bit of, of uh, traveling with me. But I, I think this is one of these incredible things. Um, I, I wasn't... I, I was excited to go to space, but, but pre-flight I said, you know, that all my colleagues talk about this, like this is the best thing in the world, and I'm really excited about the experiments that I'm going to do on board, right? This is, this, this is science as its driver, but this whole seeing the planet thing, it's, it's a benefit, but this isn't the main reason I'm going. Um, luckily, it was, that was a really ridiculous thing to think of because it <laughs> knocked my socks off when I saw the planet for the first time. It's, this, it's so uh, incredibly blue and glowing and bright. And I think we get this a little bit from uh, some of the IMAX movies and that kind of thing, but the, sh the shutter on a camera does not capture the dynamic range of what light does in the human eyeball. Mm. And so the brightness of the planet was incredible and the three-dimensionality. So actually seeing the planet um, there and seeing that depth that you don't get in a flat view, I hope um, even if people physically can't go, that we're doing things with imagery. People follow the rovers online. Um, you know, this is a way for folks to actually really uh, see the solar system. I think there's so much value in that. You allude on the overview effect, so the psychological effect of seeing the world from in space. And, and that's definitely one of the advantages of going to low Earth orbit. What are advantages of not only LEO, but cislunar and the moon and Mars and, and going to these foreign entities. Yeah, so um, from a, a lunar, scientifically from a lunar perspective, um, there's some really interesting things that you can do with heliophysics um, in, in lunar orbit. Uh, remote sensing of Earth from a very far distance. Uh, Physics-wise, um, you know, if you're looking at, at L1 or, or L2, there's really interesting, uh, you know, you've got this, this uh, gravity well to work with and, and you can actually go across um, this huge gra gravitational gradient, which, which does a lot of things for instrumentation. Um, scientifically, it, geologically, obviously the moon is interesting for um, solar system formation. From a biologist point of view, I wasn't that interested in the moon for a long time. Um, it, there's no biology there. So, well, this is, this is great, but let's head to Mars. Um, however, I've been really interested in the moon recently because it's the perfect negative control. So when we go to Mars, we're going to be looking for life on Mars, uh, if we go do all of our mapping on the moon, anything we find we know we've brought with us. And so it's actually an excellent experimental setup to test uh, any kind of, of search for life. So there's a, there are a lot of things to do in terms of, of space experiments. We can talk about this for days. I'm sure you can think of 200 more. Um, well, I, you know, we uh, uh, send a lot of rovers to the surface of Mars because there's a lot that we can learn from Mars about our own planet, about the evolution of, of the planet. Um, we're still hoping to be able to find some evidence of extinct life uh, there on the surface. Um, but if, uh, uh, if humans ever do get to the point where they, we have the ability to get to Mars and, uh, and uh, descend to the surface and operate on the surface of Mars, I think there's a nice uh, uh, collaboration that can happen between the robotic uh, side of uh, space exploration and the human side of space exploration. I mean, there's no substitute for the human brain in terms of the ability to uh, make decisions and draw conclusions real time and adjust the investigations that you're doing. Uh, but sometimes on uh, hostile environments, they need a little bit of help, whether it be a, a robotic vehicle or you know additional uh, sensors or, or uh, equipment and things like that. And so I think there's a, there's a nice synergy. And I, I do hope that humankind expands uh, beyond uh, just the Earth. You perfectly segued to my next question of being from NASA JPL with unmanned rovers going to Mars, spirit, opportunity, curiosity, mm -hmm. and then obviously being in space yourself. What are the advantages and disadvantages of crewed and uncrewed missions? So we're expensive. Um, <laughs> humans are tough to keep alive. We are really finicky, finicky creatures. We need a narrow temperature range, a narrow pressure range. You have to feed us and give us water. Um, it's, it's actually incredibly challenging. One of the interesting things about human missions is that we actually do learn about what it takes to keep human beings alive. So things like 
uh, water purification. It's a mostly closed loop on space station. It's about 90% closed loop. And so we're actually learning a lot about how to continuously operate with a very small amount of water and, uh, and constantly be purifying that water. Um, it's today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee up there in space all the time. <laughs> so these are, these are things that we learn about uh, CO2 capture from the atmosphere uh, generating oxygen. Uh, interesting, interesting technologies for the planet. Um, but we are expensive, and so it's actually really great to have a portfolio of missions where you have uh, robotic missions and you have human missions, and, and we're, we're going to send things robotically first. We can go farther right now with robots and we can with humans. Um, but then I think we're going to have uh, dual missions where we actually are, are for example, doing okay. things on the surface of Mars um, where you can sterilize a robot, right? You can, you can clean a robot much better than you can a human. So you might send a robot into a, a sensitive area where you want to do some sampling and then have a, actually a, a robotic-human partnership on that mission. Mm -hmm. So I, there's always a place for both. Um, the, the times that we... You, sometimes you have to think about when you don't want humans around. So if you're sampling for biology, you might not want humans around. If you're setting up a sensitive physics instrument, you might want a human-tended space station, but not a permanent presence on that particular station. Um, so it's a, it's a balance of, of who you want to go, where you want to, where you want to go, and how you want to get there. I'd, I'd say the advantage uh, that robotic or uncrewed uh, exploration has is, is the, the depth that we can reach into our own solar system and the depth into the uh, uh, into the universe with uh, remote sensing, imaging, large telescopes, and things like that. Uh, it just it it fills a different niche than the than the human exploration. So lovely. I'd love to know who were some of your role models growing up. And, and Kendra, you had Sally Ride on yeah. one of your slides, <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of us can relate to that. And additionally, who some of your mentors are now. So one of my role models actually was uh, my grandmother. She worked at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. She was um, a research technician. And um, so, you know, growing up, I assumed that everybody worked in a lab because I heard these stories. And, um, and so I just thought this was, uh, this was an incredible thing to do. And um, some of my, uh, you know, my mentors now are, are still at NASA, but then they're also uh, active researchers in their particular field. And I really enjoy um, actually talking to mentors from other disciplines. So I think it's particularly fascinating, and I encourage all of you, um, as you go further in academia, you get deeper and deeper and more specialized into your niche until you're the single person that knows the most about the one thing that you're studying. But it's actually great to just hop to a completely different field. And I, really, it's just a little bit of academic jargon, and you can pick up whatever somebody else is doing. So uh, going in, in, you know, as a biologist, going and seeing how um, a physicist might do their experiment or handle their large data set is actually incredibly informative. And so, um, you know, engineering, you might want to run over to the med school at some point and see what these interesting living organisms do and, uh, and, and find mentors in all of your different areas. And so I have quite a few uh, in, in areas that are not necessarily what I studied as my discipline. Um. I guess one thing that I would share from my experience, JPL is an interesting place in that we have a lot of people, I'm creeping up into one of those people, that have been there uh, 30, 40, 50 years um, and have worked at, at JPL their entire career. <laughs> I'm rapidly getting to be one of those people. Um, and so I, I guess I would probably relate the story about um, uh, we talk about diversity in the workplace, but we tend to forget about generational diversity. And um, I would say that when I joined JPL, my mentors were some of the folks that had been there 40, 50 years. They were uh, an engineer's engineer. They were people that could solve complex equations with a slide rule. They didn't have to have a computer model everything. They had an intuitive feel for the discipline. And so I tried to learn as much as I could from those folks. And I certainly admired uh, their abilities. I don't think I've ever matched their abilities. And um, I see a lot of them uh, disappearing from the workforce and from, uh, from the workplace. And I think we, uh, we need to continue to uh, reach out to some of the uh, um, more experienced generations and continue to uh, capitalize on what they have to offer 
for the for the younger generations. Yeah, Kendra, what do you envision for the role of NASA in this evolving future space ecosystem? Oh, well, I, I, I think de definitely NASA and all government agencies play a significant role in fields where it is not easy to be profitable. I mean, we are talking about fundamental science research. There is sometimes not a profit associated with that. And if the government is not funding that type of work, if they're not funding you know, uh, exploration and trying to discover if there's life on the oceans of Europa, um, we won't have that d those discoveries. And so I think NASA, even though commercial space is expanding, um, and I think that there's a uh, great value in that, I think there is always a role for the government labs and the government investment in fundamental science. So. And Kate, what was it like flying on the first test flight of the Soyuz spacecraft? Yeah, so our, our Soyuz was a, a block upgrade, which is a really interesting um, program, how the Russians design spacecraft. So it's essentially uh, uh, the same spacecraft, and, and they do small incremental upgrades. And so I think we had, um, I think we were moving from bytes of RAM to kilobytes of RAM. <laughs> so uh, there were some, some uh, computerized upgrades. But it's, it's an interesting way to design equipment because there's always... Uh, there's a graceful degradation, and at the end of the day, um, you can actually fly the spacecraft completely manually with, with no computer systems with a periscope. And uh, in the U.S., we tend to go for a new space program, new spacecraft every couple decades, and we, we throw out what we did the last time, and we go to a completely different vehicle, um, which is also, you know, this is an incredibly great place to be in, and uh, I hope you're all watching uh, what we're doing with new vehicle design and, and some of the things that are coming out, um, you know, that is a place where we've got uh, great interest from commercial space and, and uh, this is a partnership really with NASA um, to build new spacecraft and they're going to be they're gonna be launching pretty soon from Florida. So I think anytime you're on a test flight, um, this is exciting. I, I thought it was great, but, you know, the, again, for me, the goal is the experiments <laughs> on board the space station. My test pilot friends were getting really excited about this test flight stuff. So I guess, uh, you know, I, I'm a member now of the Experimental Society of Test Pilots. I think I can join. Nice. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it was, it's a new vehicle always has some things to work out. And uh, we'll just say it's exciting uh, to have hardware challenges. <laughs> uh, so now moving to the submissions and upvotes. This one has 26. So now that private space is accelerating its innovation in space transportation, so NASA, should NASA leave that field and refocus its resources on fundamental research? So I don't, I don't know that you would leave the transportation field. So when you're doing um, a space experiment, you always have to either get the experiment there um, or if you're, if you're looking at human exploration, you have to get the people there. And so I think you're, there's always a role for NASA in, in the transportation uh, architecture and often as a system integrator. Um, and so you can liken it a little bit to the federal government building highways. Um, you're not necessarily going to be responsible for all of the commercial buildings that happen along the highways, but if you can get people to uh, these businesses, this is important. So as a transportation architecture provider, and then also, uh, as Kendra said, really a, a funder of basic research. And so a lot of basic research is at a low enough TRL level or it's not something that's immediately commercializable. And, and um, this doesn't mean that it won't three or four iterations down the road lead to a product or something that you can put on the market, but, uh, but basic research often is not commercializable. And so there is always a role, I think, for uh, government funding uh, for academic research. And, and we've shown time and time again, there's so many benefits uh, you, these dollars that you invest in basic research uh, really will provide huge economic benefits down the road, um, but you can't always tie that to a product immediately. Part of it is, 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 is research for increasing the knowledge that's going to help with our future product development. Yeah, I, I would uh, say that NASA, even though it, we may have a significant number of uh, commercial providers of launch vehicles, uh, there's always uh, the reach for more capability. And the reach for more capability requires 
research. It requires research investment. It requires uh, pushing the envelope on technology. Um, and you want to be doing that uh, with, a, with a focus. And the uh, NASA centers have such, uh, such an investment in infrastructure and capabilities in that area. It would be a shame to, to lose that um, and not have, uh, have engagement of the NASA centers in the transportation part of space exploration. Um, certainly, uh, production of, of launch vehicles and things like that is best done by commercial industry. Um, but uh, you want to be a smart buyer, you want to be a smart integrator, you want to uh, know the systems that you're trying to push to the next level. And so I don't think the, that NASA should get out of the transportation uh, business, uh, space transportation business, um, as much as I favor the basic research and, and science. Great. This one's interesting. To what extent should the government restrict commercial space exploration in the interest of planetary protection? So I think we're in this really interesting time um, for, for the moon and Mars. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, the moon. And, and you know, we, we've sent a few things there. There's been some orbital missions and, and some lander missions. But we really haven't had a big presence on the moon. And, and uh, we've had a, a small robotic presence that's been very controlled and restricted. So as we start to go and really populate uh, things like lunar orbit, lunar orbit's not a mess right now like, like Earth orbit is in terms of debris, but it's, it's going to be if we don't think about it. Um, surface ops, you know, I talked about the moon as a sterile environment. Well, it's, it's sterile for now, uh, we think. Um, and, you know, what's going to happen when we start to have more surface presence there? Is this something that we should try to control um, should we have particular areas that you can go and that you can't go? For example, the Apollo sites are historic sites. Um, just from an experimental point of view, we just let this experiment happen and let humans populate places. I want to watch what happens to the microbes. Uh, and we've, you know, this is a big longitudinal experiment, um, but we've got this great opportunity to sample as we start to civilize a, a planetary surface. So this is a, this is going to take a whole career to do this experiment. But um, Mars in particular, you've got to think even more about because this, this is then, uh, you know, you want to preserve the capability for basic research on Mars. One of the big things we're looking at is, is signs of life on Mars. Um, once you go there and, and start to put your microbes all over it, then it's, yep. it's really difficult experimentally. So I think we actually shouldn't focus so much on controlling uh, the microbial burden or, or, or the presence as much as defining it and understanding what the boundaries are. It's incredibly expensive to try to sterilize all of your spacecraft and your spacesuits and your humans, particularly when we have a lot more microbes than spacecrafts do. But uh, when we do have companies that are going there, we're probably going to have to pretty carefully control initially what they do and where they go. Eventually, it's, it's, you can't control this forever. But it's a, it's a new territory for us as a species. And so we do need to think about, for a little while, what do we need to preserve scientifically in this new territory? I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, once we contaminate Mars, it's done. We're, our, our science experiments are done. And, um, and so we will have lost the opportunity to, to, to learn and discover what we can. So I, I think uh, educating uh, commercial companies or tourism clubs that want to go to Mars, whatever it might be, on the why. Why do we protect it? What, what does it take to protect it? Uh, there's been a significant amount of research on, on sterilization techniques. If you do it right, it does affect the design of your vehicle. You need to know that. You need to know how to factor that into the design of what you're doing. And, and that's, a, that's a knowledge base that exists within, uh, within NASA and other international space communities. Uh, when we do missions with, uh, with the Europeans, we work closely together on planetary protection and sterilization requirements, and, and there's no reason why the commercial companies uh, couldn't adhere to those same standards or should be expected to adhere to those same standards. And we may have zones where, you know, it's, uh, we're going to have to do a little bit of study on aerosol transport and figure out how far uh, these, these um, things can go. But you might say, all right, if you want to, you don't have to do planetary protection if you go in this zone, um, but you, you can land here, but you can't land here. And mm -hmm. so we may start thinking about 
Um, maybe you have some areas that are, have less restrictions on them, and then we have some areas that are kept for uh, preservation, essentially, for scientific study. We actually currently do that with our rovers. <laughs> if you go below the surface, it's a different planetary protection category requirement than just staying above the surface. So, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Kendra, you mentioned space tourism, and <laughs> I'm a show of hands who in this room would like to travel to space themselves, either as an astronaut or as a space <laughs> tourist. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, and someone's curious about uh, what you both view as the future of space tourism. I, I, um, I like to sometimes read the books that my kids are reading, and so I just finished the Stuart Gibbs book series on uh, uh, space tourism on the moon, and uh, I think it would be great. I mean, I, I hope it's not as, <laughs> as bad as that book makes it out to be, um, but it, it was a great book, by the way, um, and, uh, and I think it would be fantastic. Uh, I mean, we're always looking for the next adventure around the corner, whether it be, you know, climbing the highest peak here on Earth or, or whatnot, and we're going to run out of adventures pretty soon, and so we should, uh, we should be looking at that next frontier. I think it's I think it's incredible. I think you know I I would like it to be something that's not just um, afforded to the ultra rich. So I would like this to be an opportunity that's available uh, for more people. And I think it's one of these incredible things that as we really do start sending more people off the planet, uh, we were we were a crew of three for a long time. You saw pictures of my my really fantastic crewmates, and our the launch of our next crew was delayed quite a bit. So we were three for a long time. And uh, American, a Russian, uh, Japanese uh, crew member. And I remember we, there was a, a launch of uh, Chinese um, Taikonauts to, this, to their space station. Different station, different orbit. You can't get there on a fire extinguisher. <laughs> uh, but, so, you know, so we've never, we never met these Taikonauts. I, I'm not sure if I ever will. But they launched, and I was so happy that day, and I went to dinner. I talked to my crewmates, and they were. I said, "Why? We're, I'm so happy. Are you happy?" They said, "Yeah, we're really excited about this." And my um, Takuya, my Japanese crewmate, said, "You know, it's because we we've, we've been three for a long time, and now we're five. And so there's something that's incredibly powerful about uh, leaving your home planet. And I really think we need to do more of this. Um, it it's you think of yourself after a little bit of time as a citizen of space." a bit more than belonging to the Earth. Uh, and I want to share that with as many people as possible. That's lovely. Kate, uh, a few for you. Uh, one's a little funny. How long does it take to start walking after returning from space? And any specific advice on becoming an astronaut? Um, so how long does it take to start walking? You can walk immediately. You're just not very good at it. <laughs> so. Um, you lose a, a lot of your proprioception. So it's really interesting neurologically. Um, I think these neural pathways don't go away, um, but they go in, they're, they're disused. And so um, you, when, you, when you're trying to balance or orient yourself, your otoliths have gotten completely used to the fact that there's no gravitational vector. So you come back, um, and, and you're not good at proprioception and balance, um, and you're, you're really... You've, uh, we did an experiment, one of the, the data points that they were sampling was when you land, what can you do post-flight? Like, what task could you accomplish when, if you land on Mars and you have to get out of the vehicle? And so they have you do all these things, and one of them was, was lay flat on, on your face and then try to get up, and they, they asked questions while you're doing this. They said, well, what do you think you weigh compared to pre-flight? And I said, well, I think I weigh three or 400 pounds, and I'm not sure why I'm stuck to this planetary surface with magnets. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I'm completely unable to, to get up from the prone position. And, and uh, you, you're not sure if you're going to fall. So you get your center of gravity really low. And it's sort of a cross between a two-year-old learning how to walk and maybe a sumo wrestler stance. <laughs> it improves after about 45 days. Um, but it, it, it's, it's really it's two weeks until you get normal at walking again and things like running and uh, you know somebody throws a ball at you and then a minute later you can get <laughs> get your hand up to, wow. to catch it so this this is great fun for our trainers in the gym they set up <laughs> obstacle courses and if, if you try to throw if you do a head tilt uh, your gyros uncage and you spin backwards pretty quickly so they, this is amusement they just watch <laughs> And then uh, your next question about advice advice um, for blind to be an astronaut. So I, I think um, 
doing whatever thing it is that you do right now. So some people think about applying to be an astronaut. Well, what, what boxes should I check? Should I learn how to fly? Should I learn how to scuba dive? Um, I get my PhD. And everybody in my class and other classes around me, it's actually been a very hard decision for them to become an astronaut because they love what they're doing so much. They're so uh, immersed in their field. They're uh, on, on a research uh, tenure track. They're a fighter pilot. They're, they're doing what they absolutely love, and it's their passion. And, um, and everybody generally really loves being an astronaut, too. But it's, it's telling that it's very hard to leave your field. And so my advice is, is to, do, to pursue excellence in your given uh, field of choice and, and to do something that is just not even a job. You wake up every morning and think, well, I've, I've absolutely got to go get into the lab and look at this latest model results I've been running because this is, I can't, you know, I can't sleep because I'm so interested in this result. That, when you're doing that, you know that you're in the right spot career-wise. And, uh, and if astronaut is in your future, then that's fantastic. As a public face, how do you handle situations where your views conflict with the official stance of NASA or are beyond your suggested talking points? <laughs> I, uh, I'm not. I'm not great at reading the talking points, so I might. I'm probably in a permanent state of being in trouble. Um, <laughs> NASA's really not that controlling about. You know, I mean, it, this there's there's a general direction that we have, and I haven't really found a huge source of conflict where, um, you know, I've got a, the, They're absolutely doing it wrong, and and we shouldn't launch that mission. That, that doesn't. That doesn't really come up. So um, I think, um, you know, there is, there is always something where you're a representative of a government agency, and that's important. Um, and, and we do a lot of work internationally, actually, and this is one of the strengths of the space station program and of our, of our international research is that we've built these partnerships. And so you do often work um, as a representative of the United States with these other countries. Uh, I, think that's a, I think that's an incredible thing. It's actually really a privilege to do that not a conflict. The only experience I've come across in that regard about talking points and, and uh, going against official positions of the agency is uh, we have to uh, be mindful that uh, we think about a lot of different mission concepts. We're always thinking of new ideas and we're exploring what's possible and what might be uh, you know, the, the next mission to Pluto or whatever it is. But a lot of that is not official. And so, so for us, at, at, at least at JPL and within the program office uh, within XEP, we have to be very mindful about not giving the impression that all of these are official, sanctioned, you know, uh, 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 NASA-endorsed missions chosen to, to go forward. There, and so we have to be mindful about the wording that we use in terms of mission concepts. It's possible to do this. It's, you know, uh, uh, it's being considered and things like that. And so we just have to be careful about that. Whenever we're dealing with nuclear material as well, uh, we have uh, you know, uh, RHUs, uh, radioisotope uh, heating units, and RTGs, which are the power source. Um, there is a lot of uh, risk communication that has to be uh, properly uh, um, shared with the, with the public in terms of what the, what the risk levels are with the launches and the analyses that go with that. Um, and so uh, we have offices that are trained with the appropriate risk communication. And, and so the, the general folks at JPL shouldn't probably be talking about that. And so, so those are really the only places that I've stumbled into uh, trying to be mindful of, of NASA policy and, and the official NASA word versus you know, talking freely and off the cuff. Can we have? Can we do audience questions? Do you guys have have questions? Are you I all these think they're awesome. submitting. Oh, the perfect. Uh, okay, <laughs> good. I want to make sure. I know that, it's weird not to yes, see a hand. Yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> so I have this so little special website that good. I'm asking the most popular voted questions, right. <laughs> and they're good. Uh, Tapes coming off. What excites the most both of you about your job? <laughs> most about your job. That's a hard everything. Um, that maybe maybe a better question is what is not exciting, and there are occasional bureaucratic meetings that you have to sit through. And uh, occasional, <laughs> yes, I try I try to sit through as few of those as possible. Um, we, we have some we have a lot of acronyms, and uh, and you just 
go get in a T-38 and go fly when you see one of those things <laughs> pop up on your calendar. So. Um, uh, for me, it's uh, it, uh, with exoplanets, there's there's new discoveries happening every day, and we, we just launched the test mission. NASA just launched the test mission, and, and we are all excited for that flood of, of data to come down. Gaia is producing uh, so much information that's going to you know change our understanding of the, the stars that uh, that these planets orbit around. And so you know every day there's something new and exciting. I mean, uh, the the Trappist discovery. Uh, I don't want to say it came out of the blue, but it was, you know, I, I mean, to be able to, to splash that across the New York Times is, uh, is just amazing. I mean, how could you not be excited about what's, what's the next discovery around the next corner? So, And a final question, but would the both of you like to travel to Mars? Would you be willing to travel to Mars? We talk about this a lot, right? This is what astronauts do when you're sitting at the bar having beer. Oh, would you go to Mars? Would you go to Mars? <laughs> Um, so yes, I would absolutely go to Mars. I would, I'd also volunteer for a year on space station. And this is a little bit of a hard thing to do. If you haven't flown, you don't know, you know, a, a year or two years is a long time. Would I really want to commit, um, that, that part of my life to it? And, um, I was pretty upset about getting in a spacecraft and coming home. I actually had a little <laughs> chat with my flight director about, uh, I, I said, I don't want to come home. He's like, well, you got it. The, you're... <laughs> Your ride is leaving, and you need to be in the seat. <laughs> so I, I think I would absolutely go to Mars. Um, you, you have to pick your crewmates a little carefully, because um, you're going to be hanging out with them for a while. <laughs> It's a long time to go to Mars. I don't. I. I. I, I don't know um, if I would go to Mars. Um, we just bought an Airstream trailer, and so I'm going to end up spending a week <laughs> in an aluminum can with my family, and I'll see how, after that experience, whether <laughs> I might want to go to Mars to escape, or I could handle being in an aluminum can for that long with a group of people. So I'll, I'll let you know in a couple of weeks after the summer vacation. <laughs> well, please join me in thanking our extraordinary Miss Kendra Short and Dr. Kate Rubin. Thank you. Also, I'd like to thank everyone involved in this extraordinary Woman in Aerospace Symposium that's been going on today and tomorrow at Stanford, MIT, and CU Boulder. A special thanks to Professor Debbie Sineski, Karen Leung, the Aeroaster Department at Stanford, and all of our sponsors. Thank you both. This has been lovely. <laughs>